Well, I would like you to look at Revelation in chapter 4, verse 4 and following that Charles Stoffus read to us from. And this is a truly amazing text. All you have to do is just watch it unfold. What you have seen in verse 4 is the throne of God. And then you have seen in verse 4 the throng around the throne, the 24 elders, priests, and kings. If you were, you know it, if you were here last week, if you didn't, you're a week behind, I can't help you, all right? Um, incidentally, if you're from Arkansas, uh, <laughs> hang in there, all right? We've faced it for years, you know, it comes around ever so often. People have said, how are you going to, you know, teach the Bible when, when uh, hell just froze over? I said, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure, but we'll press on, okay? And so, there you see these people in heaven in verse 4, and it's you and I. It's the raptured church, and we are in glory. The restrainer, like Lot, has been removed, and now judgment has come. The restrainer of what? Second Thessalonians 2 says the day of the Lord will not come until the restrainer, meaning the church is taken away. Restrainer of what? Well, the restrainer of the tribulation, the restrainer of the coming of Antichrist, the restrainer of the wrath of God, the restrainer of the day of the Lord. Uh, in what sense does the church restrain? How many times have you heard this? If God is just, why does he let these things take, take place? Why World War II? Why communism, Nazism, fascism? Why the stuff that takes place? Biblically, your answer is his wrath is restrained. There will be judgment someday. Now, his wrath is restrained. Restrained by what? It is restrained by what the New Testament calls, 2 Thess chapter 2, the mystery of lawlessness is at work until the restrainer is taken away. The mystery of lawlessness is the divine purpose for evil. There is a mystery as to why evil is allowed to continue. That is called the mystery of of lawlessness. Why does God allow evil to continue? Because he is saving out the people. Amen. Consider the patience of our God to be salvation, Peter said. God is saving out a people. All that the Father hath given me, Jesus said, the elect, they will come to me. The one who comes I'll not cast out. I will raise them on the last day. And then Paul said, but when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then the Redeemer will come. So why is there a restraint on the judgment of God? Because God is saving to himself a bride, a body, a flock from both Jew and Gentile, and that is the mystery of the church. Someday the restrainer will be taken away, the church will be raptured, and then judgment will come. And that is why you see in verse 5, as soon as the church is in glory, verse 5, restraint is removed. Out from the throne comes flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. In verse 3, you saw around the throne a rainbow withholding the wrath of God. Now Lot is home. The church is home. And so now in verse 5, there is a flood coming. There is a storm. There is thunder from on high. It is coming. You remember at Sinai that you saw thunder and lightning and the blast of a trumpet and an earthquake? That was Sinai sending a sign of the holiness and the, the justice and the inviolable um, righteousness of God and now here it comes lightning flashes peals of thunder and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne 
which are the seven spirits of God. This is a reference to the Holy Spirit. In chapter 1, the uh, author said, Peace to you from he that was and is and is to come, God, and before the Lamb, Christ, and from the seven spirits before the throne, the Holy Spirit. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. It's illustrative. Seven, the number of completeness, lamps, light, and purity, fire. And they are before the throne. Why are they before the throne? Just as God sends the flood, God will send his spirit for a great ingathering. Do you all know that one of the greatest times of salvation in the history of man is going to be the tribulation period? It is. If you just turn over just a couple of pages until chapter 7, and chapter 7, uh, the tribulation is about to shift gears into a more intense judgment. And God says, don't do it because uh, there's somebody in verse 3. Don't harm the earth to see the trees until we've sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads, until they're marked. The people on that rebellious earth that become God's people. And in verse 44, verse 4, here they are. I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. Sealed from every tribe of the sons of, what's your word? Israel. The church is not mentioned from chapter 6 all the way through the return of Christ. 18. It's not mentioned. Israel is the key idea. Finally, we see Israel becoming what they're meant to be, as priests of God, heralding the truth of the, of the Messiah who came and will come. And from verse 5 down through verse 8, there is 144,000 Billy Grahams preaching Apostle Paul's from Israel. How did they come to that? The Holy Spirit of God opened their eyes and took away their covering. Paul said, until this day when Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But when men turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. All of a sudden they can see. In verse 9, what do they bring about? After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every tribe and the tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lord. Who are these Gentiles that have come in huge number to be saved? Well, they have heard the gospel from verse 5 through verse 8. The preaching of these Apostle Pauls. And so, is there going to be salvation during the tribulation period? Yes, there is. Do I want to know about it? No, I don't. So, let's go back here to chapter 4. And so, we see before the throne there is death and there is life that is coming. And in verse 6, and before the throne there was something like a sea of glass like crystal. We sing it in one of our hymns, casting down their golden crowns before the glassy sea. The presence of God in heaven, it isn't like old Mother Hubbard being crawled over by all these children. There is a throne and then there is what the Puritans would call a sea clear as ether. That there is a presence around God. At Sinai, they built a fence around Sinai, a boundary. In the temple of God, there is a veil in heaven, there is a recognition of God's presence, of glory. Like a throne room, there is nothing before the throne. It is open. The king sits by himself. And so there is this presence of visible holiness. It's a presence, but it is clear as crystal. And in verse 6, there is someone that is there. Four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And the next verse says, uh, eyes within. And they have four faces. One is that of a lion, one is that of a calf, one is that of a man, one is that of an eagle. Two interpretations of this. One is that they represent the attributes of God as the king, the calf, the servant, man being a person, uh, and uh, the eagle, one that is... Uh, ineffable, inexorable, that is above man, unexp inexplicable. The other view, I think, is more consistent. And that is that they are living creatures. That they represent all of the creation. 
before this holy God, here are creatures. And uh, they have four faces representing the polarity of creation. The four, north, east, south, west. These are the creatures. You have the lion, the king of the beast. You have a calf, a sacrificial animal. You have the inexplicable eagle. You have man in the image of God. And so you have these creatures that represent the creation and they have eyes looking to God, eyes behind them looking to God, eyes within them looking to God. Zechariah 9.1, it says, the eyes of men look to the Lord, especially of the sons of Israel. We all look to God. Now, Psalm 139, thou hast, where can I go to flee from thy spirit? If I go to heaven, thou art there. If I go into shield, thou art there. Thou hast enclosed me before and behind. You're always watching me. I'm always looking to you. Uh, Psalm 104, 27. All the creation waits for you to give them their food in due time. Give us this day our daily bread. All the creation looks to God to care for them. And so here are four creatures. And I like the idea that it's behind and before and within the very inner part of man, his mind, his intellect, his will, his emotion, his soul cannot be satisfied by anything but God. So all the creation is seen as looking to him. And some have said that this is predictive of something, of the four gospels. Matthew is the lion, the uh, king of Israel, the king of Judah, the lion of Judah. That's Matthew. Mark, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom for many. Here is the calf, the sacrificial animal. Luke is the perfect man that Jesus became. And in John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is the inexplicable eagle that flies above us. And so all of the creation Christ came down to, to redeem it back to himself. And so in verse 7, uh, well, we've looked at verse 7. In verse 8, and the four living creatures, these are called in the book of Isaiah, seraphim. Seraph means to burn. The seraphim are the burning ones. It's said of Lucifer before his fall in Ezekiel 28, he walked among the coals of fire in God's presence. Here are the burning ones, asbestos angels, I believe is the Hebrew that they live in the presence of God in the midst of this, this person that in the eternal state there will be no need of a son for God is the son and they live in his presence. And the four living creatures, each of them having six wings, the book of Isaiah speaks of them. With two wings they cover their face, with two wings they cover their feet, with two wings they fly because when you're in the presence of royalty you would cover your face you would cover your feet. Uh, it is said that the salute comes from soldiers facing the queen of England and covering their eyes upon her glory. Uh, young ladies, when they meet someone of note, they will courtesy. They will spread their dress and kneel over their feet. That is called a curtsy. And so it is the angels are showing reverence toward God. And with two, they flew. And in verse eight, they cry out something. They cry out, holy, 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 before Israel's holy God. Why threefold holy? May I suggest the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Just as the Aaronic blessing is the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Uh, he is also Israel's faithful God. The Lord God. The name for Lord in the Old Testament is God's covenant name. It's the tetragrammaton they called it. It's Y-H-W-H. Yahweh. I am who I am. That word doesn't occur in the New Testament you get the, 
the Greek term that corresponds to Yahweh. It's spelled A-D-O-N-A-I, Adonai. That's the word here, Adonai, Theos. This is Israel's covenant God. It's not just a G-O-D, supreme being. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A lot of fundamentalists in heaven. It is the God of the Bible. It is the God of creation. He is Adonai. He is the Almighty. The Hebrew, Hebraic term for Almighty is El Shaddai. Shad being the mountain, the Almighty God. Here we simply call it the Almighty So he is Israel's holy God, faithful God, mighty God, who was and who is and who is to come. The sovereign God of history who started it, continues it, and will bring it to an end. And in verse 9, he is the glorious God. The living creatures give him glory. It's when you recognize that you are not deity, that he is deity. The creation is not God. Amen. You don't make a figure of the creation and call it God. It's called idolatry. You don't call the creation God. It is called uh, pantheism or monism. People ask me if you're uh, cremated. Is it okay to get cremated? I say, well, everybody's going to get cremated ultimately. All right. So it doesn't matter. But if you want to get cremated to save money, feel free. If you're going to be cremated so we can take you out to the 16th green at uh, some golf course, and throw you down and you can be part of the putting green and the trees. Now you're a Hindu and we don't want to do that. And so you're not going to get to be part of the creation. All right. I know that disappoints you, but we are distinct from it. And so the creation claims here these angelic beings that God is glorious. I think that's why we call matter, matter. You know what matter means? Mother, mater, mother nature. No, it's not mother nature. It is creation to the glory of God. Feel free to call it matter, however. And in verse 9, not only glory, but they give honor. That is the reverence and the deference that you give to a divinity as you honor him. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And you give him thanks. It is a glorious, honorable, benevolent God. And without him, without the firmament, we can't breathe. Whenever our astronaut would show us those pictures of the earth, you notice that little thin blue onion skin around it? That's what we breathe. And without it, we all die. God made the firmament, the thinned out space. Uh, water to keep us alive, food, teeth to tear and bite and grind and pull right here. What kind of God does this? You know, I was over at my, my bi-monthly visit to my chiropractor the other day, and I was looking at, on the chart, the spine. And being a biology minor, I knew everything that I was looking at except genetics that I made a seven on, on, a, on a particular test. And I looked at the spine and going out from all of those vertebrae, s- perfectly kept in line by discs with a foramen down the middle of your spinal column with these branches going out so that when your brain said, move, bzz, and it moves, amazing. And I just looked at it and thought, What an accident. (laughs) That is. And it's got this curve. So you and I would have just built it straight up and down. Like Frankenstein, that's how we'd have been. We've got this curve, so the thing gives. It's got, you do this, and you've got what's called an atlas and an axis. And they turn. One stays in place. And one turns, amazing, and it will not harm that cord that runs up and down. It'll fit right into here. And it's got this thing called a brain. I remember my 
kinesiology prof going, we still don't know what this thing is. We don't know what a memory is. How does it hold a memory? How does it know sweet is sweet and bitter is bitter and pungent is pungent? We don't know. Why does the guy in England know that it's the same smell as the guy in the Congo? That there's this thing that runs throughout men. We don't know. And how do you get all this from a couple of genes and a sperm and an egg and a DNA? Can you spell uh, the term for DNA? Can you pronounce the term for DNA? And yet, there it is. And every time I look at it, I just shake my head as to how somebody could come up with that. Thanksgiving, amen? Thanksgiving. Let me show you something. Go to your left to Romans chapter 1, just real quickly. Because this is the fundamental recognition of man, that there is a God, and man is not it, and the universe is not it, and gods are not it. Men don't go to hell because they're not brilliant and can't figure it out. They go to hell because they think they are and they will not bow to the self-evident. I have to talk sometimes to atheists and I say, you know, I'll argue with you about creation and order and man and conscience and morality and history, but this all begs the question. All I'm going to try to do is remove what you're hiding behind. You know there is a God. You may act like there is no God, but you will not react like there is no God. You might act like there is no God until some guy that doesn't bring your daughter home safely. Then you're going to get all Baptist on him. All right. <laughs> Real quick. Everybody acts atheist and reacts Puritan. It's just that atheism is easier on our own perverse morality for just a moment to take out the, the mirror in front of us. No, Paul says in verse uh, 19 about the wrath of God, that which is known about God, Romans 1, 19, is evident within them. God made evident, evident to them. They know, the word for evident is the word clear. Men know. Helen Keller said, I knew him. I just didn't know his name. And she was in the dark. And so he says, men know within them because God put something in front of them. 20, since the, what's your word? Creation of the world. His invisible attributes. You see power. You see wisdom. You see order. You see uh, strength. You see glory. His eternal power and his divine nature, that's one word in the Greek, his Godhead. You know it's not an idol. You know it's not a snake God or a star God. You know it is a supreme being. You know that. They have been clearly seen, understood through what? And that's one word in the Greek. Understood through the poema, the workmanship, the craftsmanship, the Michelangelo's David. You see it. You see that spinal column. Y'all ever studied a cell? It's called cytology. Ever studied a cell? You will shake your head. It's like an enormous factory. They said that if you put a scale on a cell, it would be as big as London if you put all the things within it that it does. And we got them all over us, and we can't try to spell ribosome. Go ahead. How about a Golgi body? Mitochondria, all these things, they're right there, test questions. And I miss them, but I worship God. <laughs> Being understood through the poema, so that they are without, what's the word? Excuse. You don't get to say you didn't know who he was. No, verse 21, even though they knew God. That is not a saving knowledge, but that is a being aware of knowledge. You knew it. You were aware of it. Every time you looked at your fingers, every time you cut your fingernails, every time you ate your dinner and your teeth worked and your esophagus worked and that stuff in your belly worked, you knew there was a God. 
and you are dead guilty. In verse 21, what should you have done? They didn't honor him. Doxazo, they should have glorified him. The chief end of man is to know God and glorify him. You didn't worship. And you didn't give, what's the word? Thanks. You ate your food like you were mad at it. And you never stopped to worship. You got a baby and you never blessed God for him. You got the rain, you got the sun, and you never ever stopped to say, our Father who art in heaven. You just enjoyed it and then you cursed the hand that blessed you. And 21, and then you had to invent your own deity. Man's not going to be an atheist. That's too scary. But he'll invent his own deity. Why doesn't he just embrace the, the verse 20 God? Because he's moral. I need a deity that will not hold me accountable. And so in verse 21, they became futile in their reasonings. They go inside of themselves to invent a God. And you notice what it's going to be? Futile. Vain. It ain't going to work. God is dead. Nietzsche. Guy put underneath that, Nietzsche is dead. God. <laughs> it ain't going to work. They're going to be futile in their speculations. And then your heart's going to be darkened. Nature abhors a vacuum. You're going to get rid of God and you're going to fill it with your own idiocy. And then you're going to get darkened to God. And 22, you're going to look at all your idiot friends and think you're smart, professing to be wise. You know what that word is? It's the word philosophy. Sophia, wisdom. Phileo, the love of wisdom. You're going to act like you're smart because you got your degree. You got your BS. Then you got your piled higher and deeper. You got your PhD. You got your MBS. Oh, never mind. And 23, two, you became a fool. That is a culture without God. You think you're smart, but you're not. And you got rid of the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of a man like the Greeks, a bird like the Romans, four-footed animals like the Assyrians, or like the Egyptians. You worshiped a dang snake. How smart is that? And so in 24, God gave you over to that standard and hell came to breakfast in your country. Go back here to Revelation. And so that is what in verse 9, the creation, these living creatures do. A holy, faithful, mighty, sovereign, glorious, honorable, benevolent God. It, they do what man is faced with and he will not do and he will risk hell before he will bend his knee. We sing in one of our hymns. It's one of the great, great hymns, but you're not allowed to sing it until December by Charles Wesley. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. All things come together. Well, in verse 10, there is one group that will worship God. You see who it is in 10? Of all of humanity for the last 20 centuries, we're not speaking of those that are before Christ. They're in glory. Their bodies aren't going to be raised till he returns in chapter 20. And we'll study that about 2022 uh, April, all right? And so, in verse 10, the 24 elders, let me stop right here and give you an oral examination. Who are the 24 elders? It's the church. It's you. Now, if you're not doing this now, you better get on it because you're going to do it someday. And the 24 elders, an elder represents a greater amount so this is a like the four living creatures exemplify creation the 24 elders exemplify uh, the kings and priests who are in God's presence they will fall down before him who is the one group throughout humanity that because of God's grace that they are chosen called enlightened who will confess Christ and glorify the Father. 
The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and forever. These are the peculiar people, uh, the royal priesthood, the people for God's own possession, that you can find an entire community living in active disobedience and passive indifference. And yet you will find in this little church on the corner, you will find 57 people that are in the worship of the God of the Bible. And they're dotted all throughout the world. They're called the light of the world, the salt of the earth, kings and priests. And they enunciate to all who will listen that they're wrong and there is a God and he is the God of the Bible. And they will cast their crowns. The crown is the bestowance of God upon that man and that woman that has shown they truly are the child of God because they stayed faithful and endured till the end. And they are given the crown. And these people will take their crown and cast it, in verse 10, before the throne, saying, all glory to God. As no other people will say. Now, someday... How many knees will bow? How many tongues will confess? Every. I read ahead. He's going to win. Is there a people on the earth today that know what's coming, that know what came? And they are the voices that stand alone. They're the light in the darkness. And they cry out. Yes, they are. Someday in the kingdom... There's going to be neither be Jew nor Greek, slave and freeman, male nor female. Nations are going to beat their swords and plowshares, spears and pruning hooks. They will worship God. Well, they will worship God, and they will sin no more, study war no more. They're going to come together. Is there a group of people on the earth now that exemplify this, that explain this, and you can walk in, and you can see? The old guy and the young guy and the poor guy and the rich guy and the male guy and the female guy, the black guy and the white guy and the Aggie and the T-Sip, and the, they're all in there together. And they're all singing together, joining hands together, loving each other, holding nothing as being their own, but whoever needs it, if I got a dollar, you got a dollar. Is there a group of people like that on the earth today? Yes, if it's done right. And they happen to be the apple of God's eye, and they happen to be the bullseye of hell. They're the bullseye of hell. Hell has to shut them down. He's got to divide them, disqualify them, deceive them, discourage them, divide them to where they have no uh, credibility. He'll disqualify them. He'll distract them to where they have no credibility. Because God does not convert men through angels. Angels protect those who do preach, and that's the church. God is glorified as much by your preaching as he is by your salvation, that he will strike a straight lick through a crooked stick, you and I. Have I ever told you all stories about Kendall? Would you like to hear some? Never mind. In verse 11, who do you think played the part in Oklahoma Baptist University's West Side Story. Who played the part of Bernardo? The shark who got knifed by Tony the jet. Was it George Clooney? Was it Brad Pitt? Or was it Kendall Luca? <laughs> yes. Who courted one of the hot Puerto Rican girls named Jamie. And now it's his wife. That's disgusting. When you're a jet, you're a jet. Verse 11. And notice what the church will do. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory, your God. Honor, we revere you. Power, you are the one who made things and will bring things under your feet. And here's why. And in verse 11, the church admits what no human will. You created 
How much? All things. Because of your will they existed and were created. That is amazing. The most self-evident recognition of man, creation, the church admits to. The most fundamental sin of man, rejection, the church abhors. When I was at seminary, I remember I had a class, a fellow named Norm Geisler taught it. And he said, you know, when you read your Bible in a sitting, you read about the sovereignty of God in creation and the mercy of God to come in the Lamb of God. And he said, you read all through the Bible. You see God rejected. You see the lamb put to death until you get to Revelation. And he said, in Revelation, he said, you make a note how many times the creation is mentioned. It's mentioned continually. And incidentally, in the book of Revelation, does the creation turn on its inhabitants? Oh, baby. You ever seen the birds? You thought that was scary? <laughs> you hadn't seen nothing yet. We're going to see the creation turn. And you see, we're going to see in chapter 5, the creation is going to sing to God. Uh, we're going to see a new heaven and a new earth. Creation finally is given the top billing that it deserves as, the, as the, the stuff made of God, made by God. And he said the other thing that you see that comes out in the book of Revelation is Christ is continually called the lamb. Isaac asked his father Abraham, where's the lamb? Abraham, God will provide the lamb. John the Baptist gets here, looks at Jesus and says, behold, the lamb of God. And then in the book of Revelation, you see, worthy is the lamb. And so Revelation takes the bow of God's power and God's grace and tightens it right here. That's who he is. Well, in verse 11, someone's typewriter is stuck. I'm back there. I probably need to punch it. You created all things, and because of your will, they were created. I want to show you something right here. Take the book of Ephesians. Go to your left to Ephesians chapter 1. And let me show you something that, you know, the Bible doesn't say a huge number of things. It says the same essential things over and over and over. And there is an idea in Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is the book about the church. It is the tome God gives you about the church. Aren't you, aren't you glad that the books of God are only like three or four pages? You know, he, he recognizes he's writing to you and I. You know, that we don't need, you know, Shakespeare. We need little things like this. And so in verse 9, he talks about your salvation and my salvation. And he says, he made known to us the mystery of his will. The mystery of God is that which the Old Testament does not detail. That in the death of the Messiah, Jew and Gentile both will become one body. That is alluded to, but it is made clear in the New Testament. So nobody can say we had to crucify Jesus because nobody understood it. It became clear. Just like Joseph, we put him to death and lo and behold, he's the king of the earth. It just dawned in front of us. And so he made known to us the mystery of his will that God has given his son to die, whereby all men, Jew and Greek, slave, freeman, male, female, Scythian, barbarian, they can all be included in the, the politic of God together and equals by Christ. You never studied that in school, did you? Because they can't see it and they won't teach it. But we know that. You know why? Because of verse 9, his kind intention which he purposed in him. We didn't think our way through to it. God took the initiative and opened our eyes and showed us the Bible and let us hear the message and it clicked. And we said, amen, and believed. And in verse 10, here's what our salvation is. It's a view to, meaning that the church age is looking forward to and resembling now an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. An administration is a rule that God rules. Prior to Christ, he ruled his covenant people by law. Now he rules men by grace. The administration that is the fullness of the times 
It's when Christ returns and God rules through the physical presence of Jesus Christ upon the earth. That is the fullness of the times. It's the blossoming forth of creation as it should be. The church is a view to that administration. That in the kingdom, you see all men on an equal footing, reborn with a new covenant in their heart of the love of God through Christ. Now, what group on the earth today has men, women, and all of us equals on common footing with a new heart and a new nature because of the rebirth of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit? What group is that? It is us right here. We are a view to that administration, meaning that if I want to say to people, you want to see what humanity ought to look like, you want to see what it will look like, come on in. And I'm going to show you all kind of people that are going to love each other. They can leave their keys on the dashboard and nobody will steal it. They can uh, leave their house open to each other and nobody will steal it. They are the people of God. And that's what creation someday is going to look like. We're a view to that. And in verse 10, you notice what he calls the kingdom? It is the summing up of all things in Christ. Now, what does that mean? How many of you have a Bible that doesn't say summing up, but has a different word? Anybody got a different word? What is it? Uniting all things. How would you translate this? It's called a hapax in Greek. It's only mentioned one time. The word kaphelo, K-A-P-H-E-L-O, means the head. In Latin, we call it cephalo. If a child is microcephalic, his head is too small. Macrocephalic, head too big. Hydrocephalic, has water on the brain. A ceph is your head. Cephalo. You have a muscle that has two heads. It is called a bicep. See? You've got three heads right here. Tricep. What's this? Quadricep. What's this? No sep. <laughs> As some of you to go like that. Remember olive oil? <laughs> she had no sep. This is the word here, summing up is the word ana kephalo. That prefix ana, A-N-A, -A, means back. And so the word ana kephalo means to head back. All things in Christ. Dig it. In the creation, originally in Genesis 1 and 2, was God head over all things? He was. He, he ruled the creation through Adam. There was obedience, there was love, eat of the tree of life, be immortal. Do not eat of that tree and try to play God or you will die. And there, the, the creatures were under him, nature was under him, cultivate, rule, be fruitful, multiply. Everything was under the headship of God. Psalm 8, God gave him his head over all things. Man. Man. Did something happen in Genesis 3? Sin. And man was cut loose from the tether. And now man didn't know what man was, didn't know what woman was, didn't know what the stars were. He didn't know what an animal was. He didn't know what right and wrong. He was, he was, he was dead. And the headship of God was lost. Did man get a new head in uh, chapter 3? You are of your father, the devil. Well, another man came. Like Adam, he was perfectly obedient, and God gave him. He was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And he was raised from the dead. And now through him, you can be born out of Adam and born into Christ. You can be born again, born from above. And the job of the church is to bring, Paul said, how many thoughts captive? to the obedience of Christ? Every thought. That is what spirituality is. 
God, what am I supposed to be as a man? Okay, what is a woman? How am I supposed to treat her? How about this kid? Work, money, morality, my emotions, jealousy, anger, lust. What do you say? My risen head, of which I am your body, my husband, of which I am the bride, my king. How am I supposed to view creation, the animal kingdom? How do I view everything? Everything it comes, anakephelo, is headed back in Christ. That's Christian growth. You and I are a view to a dispensation that will be suitable to the fullness of human history when all things are headed back in Christ. Someday, men will beat their swords into plowshares and they will go up and say, let us go up to the house of God that we can learn of his word and walk in his ways. Won't that be great? Now is what you and I are supposed to look like. We're in anticipation. Somebody can walk in and go, so that's salvation. Ah, now I see it. But if I'm the devil, I got to get to you. And so that is what Revelation chapter 4 is about. We see a group of people among all the peoples of the earth doing what someday they will all do when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, you and I are the first. We're the shock troops. We take the hit. Have those of our kindred died for this message? Have they been torn asunder? Have they been thrown to the lions? Have they been buried alive? In Japan, to get rid of the Christian voice, they crucified them upside down on the surf and let the tide come in and drowned them. That's what they did to our brethren. Russia would put them on an archipelago someplace out in the middle of nowhere, let them die. Poland, they disappear. You don't know where they went. And so the devil has got his due with us we're the guys that stand we're the guys that stand and there we are and God says good job good job let's remember him father in heaven for just a few moments we want to remember him someday we're going to fall down in front of the throne and cast our crowns and lift our voices And say, worthy art thou. And you are in the process of grooming us for that day. Teaching us now to be far away fellers. Teaching us to see what no one can see. To know what no men know. To behave like all men wish men would behave. To love each other like men would give anything to love each other. To have marriages that resemble what they ought to be. Kids that approximate what they would ought to be. Because we know there is a great distance between who we are and who we will be. But we're continually cutting down that margin until the day that we die. And we shall be complete. We shall look upon him. And so magnify him in our hearts this day, we'll ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.